Government IT. Federal government IT. It's big. And it's bad. I don't mean bad as in bad. It's like bad as in badass stuff, especially when you have a CIO who's focused on DevOps and connecting with users and the business. I am Michael Craigsman, episode 115 of CXO Talk, with my glorious and fabulous co host, Vala Afshar Vala. <laughs> I think you should save the big announcement in your screen uh, describing our extraordinary CIO who's, who's with us, John Owens, CIO of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. How are you, John? Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you both. John Thank Owens, you. CIO of the patent, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. How are you all doing? We're doing terrific. We're doing. We promise we're not going to talk sports. Uh, so, John, <laughs> could you <laughs> could you briefly uh, talk to us about your uh, your professional background, please, for our audience? Uh, sure. I started my career going to college for computer science, computer engineering at Clarkson University. I uh, became a programmer, worked my way up through several businesses, uh, General Electric, Martin Marietta, E-Systems, Mel Part Division, all as government contractors for uh, the military contracts. Uh, then I joined a little itty bitty company called America Online back in the day, became AOL LLC, and uh, did, left there in 2008 and uh, came to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, in hopes of making a better patent system by improving its IT systems. Okay, so give us some context about the USPTO, as we uh, love to call it. Tell us about the USPTO, the size, the scope, uh, what it's responsible for. Sure. Um, well, we have over 12,000 employees. The United States Patent and Trademark Office uh, our background is actually founded right in the Constitution uh, where our forefathers talked about the protection of intellectual property and at that time patents. Trademarks came a little later during I believe the 1850s. Um, and uh, the basic concept that as an inventor you should profit from your ideas and uh, someone shouldn't steal them from you and profit from them without you sharing in that profitability. Uh, but in exchange, you would then make your inventions public and other people would be able to build upon your ideas and uh, make even better and better and better things. So uh, we handle both uh, patent examination and trademark examination. And uh, of course, uh, through that examination, the dissemination of both patents and trademarks to the world is part of my job as the chief information officer, along with the operation and maintenance of all the public and internal facing IT uh, to support that innovation that the nation and actually the world brings here to the US for uh, registration. Wow. John, can you talk a little bit about the size and scope of your organization, IT organization, and perhaps talk a little bit about major technology initiatives that you're, that you're leading? Sure. Um, I have about uh, 650 employees. I have almost 700 and something openings, 6, 720 openings. So if uh, people are interested in joining us here at the USPTO, uh, you might want to look on USA Jobs after, uh, after this is all done because uh, we do have openings. Uh, we are looking for um, other folks to join us with technical skills, particularly computer programmers. Uh, and engineers, just to put a little plug in for us. Did you say uh, 700? Did you say 700 openings? Is, is uh, no, I had 720 positions, 680 something filled. So okay. there's a good number of openings there, and, and we try to keep Great. bringing in good talent. Um, what was your other question? <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and a little bit about your technology initiatives. Oh yes. So it all started with a complete redo of the complete infrastructure here at the USPTO. Started in 2008, ended in five years. We have the most modern technologies and infrastructure that you can buy. And then in the last few years, we've started initiatives to rewrite all of the legacy applications, some of which were built back in the 1970s on mainframes and COBOL and AGOL and uh, some of which were built during the 80s and 90s and we're in the middle of a huge uh, 
user-centered design, agile development practices over the last uh, five, five years, I guess. And, uh, of course, a focus on DevOps, uh, rapid delivery of those products. Uh, there are a few major ones, patents end-to-end, -end, which is a complete rewrite of the patents environment, and trademarks next generation. Uh, trademark actually had an electronic processing system before, and uh, this is a rewrite on top of modern technology, along with new fee processing uh, systems, uh, brand new web page, uh, a My USPTO experience where you can customize your own, you know, whether you're a customer or an internal user, customize your experience uh, type of initiative. Think of it as uh, a widget-based environment where you can add the widgets that you care about if you're a trademark person or a patents person or if you're a big law firm, both. Okay. Uh, and it's all built on top of uh, various cloud platforms. We're running an internal Red Hat cloud based on cloud forms. We also heavily use the FedRAMP, Amazon Cloud, and Google Cloud uh, to both host and disseminate our data uh, as well as handle scalability uh, for the, use, the end users. Uh, products. John, uh, tell us how federal IT or projects in your organization are different from those in the private sector. Because I'm not sure that everybody has an appreciation for the fact that, that there are important differences. And so maybe give us some of that context. Well, to be honest, I've worked very hard to make them uh, very much like the outside. Uh, we no longer do, uh, well, we do a little bit of waterfall type of, of, of projects, but we, uh, all of our new projects are all agile. Uh, because the United States Patent and Trademark Office is fee funded, and we are given exemptions under Title 35 uh, to work around the FAR, or certain parts of the FAR, uh, we are a little different than most federal agencies. So no tax dollars goes to fund this this organization. Uh, it's all fees. And uh, we have certain exceptions, particularly around the sole source selection of uh, technologies and services. So I'm not the atypical federal government agency. Uh, with that, I also have certain leniencies in using uh, more cutting edge uh, technologies, uh, though I have to meet all the FISMA and, and federal regulations on, you know, of course, security, which is a uh, primary focus, uh, but I don't have a lot of the same constraints. But we manage our environment through a series of project management best practices that we took right out of industry. In fact, the whole DevOps movement, which I am a very big supporter of in the federal government, is right out of industry. So I would say that I, I'm hopefully not that much different. Hmm. Great. That's terrific to hear. So we've had, like yourself, extraordinary CIOs on our show, and we always like to ask CIOs how they define success in IT. Can you share with us maybe a certain number of KPIs or maybe it's a management philosophy? How do you define successful IT? Well, I take it a step at a time. Uh, here at the USPTO, it's about quality and service availability. Uh, this is going to sound a little odd. But I would like to have that the, fa the failures of the United States Patent and Trademark Office IT systems make the front page of the paper. Now, that does sound odd. Now, <laughs> most people would say, well, why would you want to be on the front page of the paper? I wouldn't. But I would like those failures to be so uncommon that they'd be top newsworthy. Hmm. Um, that the system was so resilient. And certainly, the systems we're building today, there are no single points of failure. They're housed in multiple data centers. They have 24 by 7 by 365 operation. They are built on, you know, Red Hat, JBoss, uh, you know, totally scalable type of technologies uh, that are out there. There's service-oriented architecture throughout. And, you know, so we've taken the best that industry has to offer and every piece of knowledge that we can gain in a, in a bunch of open source and best practices. And we've really turned that into a, a robust platform and uh, I would like the systems here, instead of the situation that they've been in over the last decade, which is quite honestly fairly poor, to meet the quality level of expectation that people have 
of a top-notch IT environment, which is full availability, full redundancy. It's always there. It's like uh, when I was a kid, there was a big push. When you pick up the telephone, there was a dial tone, not the date mm -hmm. itself, but that was a thing at one time. Uh, I think that it's pretty much the same here. I, I want the expectation to be that the USPTO will satisfy all of your IT needs when it comes to patents and trademarks and the dissemination of information and the submission of that, that data um, without interruption. And, and that's the picture of success. So, so you're very focused on DevOps. You've mentioned it a couple of times, several times. And you have a DevOps conference going on now as we speak. So let's, let's talk about DevOps. So, so to begin, give us a, just a, for those who don't know, the, a very, very, very brief primer of DevOps. Why, what is it? Why do you care about it so much? Why are you so passionate about it? Well, uh, yes, we, we, we were the first to host, uh, the USPTO hosted uh, the first DevOps days in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it, su it surprised me. I think I mentioned this earlier that, you know, the government spends about you know, $80 billion of IT spend and there's a major IT movement towards what's known as rapid delivery. Uh, that's DevOps. And uh, the government's really wasn't participating in it and there was no um, organization that was willing to host a conference. And so I volunteered. Uh, and the USPTO is very happy to do so. And I think, it, it, though it's only going to go on for about another hour and 15 minutes, uh, it's been a great couple of days. So Le, before I describe DevOps, you have to understand some of the things behind it. And, and previously, uh, over the last couple of decades, there's been movements towards uh, both user-centered design, uh, basic concept, ask the user what they want and build what they want. Uh, and then you know, agile development, which is take shorter in for, you know, shorter steps, work with the customer on a daily basis, show them what you've built as you go along, fail fast, recover fast, and produce a quality product that they can use. And, uh, and as I said, we're, we're basing all of our new developments for patents and, and in trademark next gen on that, that style of, of software development. But then comes rapid delivery, because you can do this really fast and the customers get really excited, but if you can't deliver it quickly, then people get disappointed because they don't want to wait one year between deliveries, right? And if you think about the way that most industries do it today using methodologies like DevOps that break down cultural barriers between development and operations, um, and to allow more rapid delivery, I mean, even if you're going from a yearly delivery schedule to quarterly or monthly, that's a huge improvement. But there are companies around the world that are doing hundreds of releases a day into production. And it's mind-boggling for a lot of people who've lived in a world of, you know, one delivery per year, but it's a major game-changer when you can talk to a customer, do, a, do an iterative development model and release an important fix in two weeks or less uh, than in years prior. So and, how, and how do you, how do you, uh, this is a, a very dramatic cultural shift for IT in the public sector and especially in the private sector. So how do you uh, get your IT department give, to have the skills and the competencies and the culture of recognizing the primacy of that goal, of that, that responsiveness goal? How do, you, how do you transform IT itself? So cultural change is the most difficult thing that a CIO or senior leader has to do in an organization. And it's not easy. And there's no one-size-fit-all uh, you know, recipe for its success. Uh, in fact, there's many more recipes, I think, for its failure. Uh, constant conversation, constant talk is a good start. Bringing in uh, speakers like Gene Kim, author of The Phoenix Project, uh, a novel about DevOps, um, and other speakers from industry. We've brought in folks from 
Etsy and, and Pinterest and a bunch of other locations, uh, other companies doing this type of work. And to give the exposure to my team that this really happens and this really works and it's not just someone writing a book to make money or it's not a fairy tale or someone that actually found a bucket of pixie dust, that this is real, right? And, and it does happen. And there are, there are pitfalls to it and there are things you have to overcome. But the first thing to overcome is the negative attitude towards the change. And hosting DevOps days was also strategic on our part, right? I wanted my folks to heavily participate and to talk to the folks that have had successes. And there's been a string of lectures over the last two days about DevOps and how they, other companies have overcome those challenges. In fact, even a couple of fellow federal organizations have come to, to observe and or participate in a DevOps movement of their own. In which case, I'm happy to see it because I want people to know that this isn't uh, just a pipe dream, that this is real. Because at the end of the day, with a backlog of IT projects that's quite lengthy here at the USPTO, unless I can rapidly deliver to my uh, constituency, both inside the office and out, I'm never going to, to catch up. Sure. Um, so it, it's, it's a necessity for us to do business this way. It's no sure. longer a nice to have. So John, you have roughly 70 openings in IT. What do you look for in terms of skills, experience? Uh, the, you look for developers that uh, you know submit code to GitHub and embrace open source and believe in agile development processes. What are some of the things you look for when you're looking to hire and bring talent to help further cultivate this innovative culture that seems to differentiate on quality, serviceability, and speed? Um, can you share a little bit about your your high you know the type of talent you look for? Sure. Um, you know, there's a plethora of talent uh, with various skills, uh, but certainly over the last year or so, it's been more heavily hardcore computer science focused. Mm -hmm. um, we've done an incredible amount of hiring in other areas, though enticing computer science computer scientists with degrees with a love of agile and and you know, Java development, we're writing the bulk of our code in Java on the JBoss platform and, and so on and so forth is all important. Uh, but the most important thing that we really look for is not how many years of experience they have, because we have a range of, of positions, but how in tuned and excited people are to tackle the difficult problems, to really become a leader and, and, and say, I'm going to tackle this and I'm going to solve it and work together as part of a team to make the you know make their ideas heard and make a difference. Um, it's those level of motivations that we're really looking for. So we have both, uh, to put it in government terms, uh, GS2210 and GS1550 positions available. The 1550 positions being uh, computer scientists, computer engineer positions uh, with positive degree requirements. This all gets back to the fact that I've been able to drive up quality in the federal government through contracting by providing developers on the Agile teams that are feds, not just contractors, and making sure that they are the gatekeepers for the code reviews. Because as we know, when the government does accept code from a contractor, now the government's responsible. So the, the other thing that I did was the United States Patent and Trademark Office and my team, who I have encouraged and driven a lot of them from industry, are the integrators. We don't rely on a contractor to do the integration for us. We hire them for their skills and to build our teams, but we place feds on those teams. We place scrum masters that are feds on those teams, and it's a continuous series of training and, and, and improvements in the skill set of the employee that makes a big difference, for which I invest uh, approximately, uh, given budgetary constraints aside, uh, $2 million a year for 40 to 80 hours of training per employee, uh, which, and, you know, certifications, et cetera, et cetera, which I very much believe in. Uh, why do you, why the importance of, including federal employees on these project teams rather than just 
relying on uh, external contractors as so many others do? Well, um, there's a different, and I don't want to sound rude since I was a contractor at one point. Again, I did work for General Electric, Martin Merritt, at E-Systems, Melfort Division. But the motivation of contractors is somewhat different than the motivation of a federal employee. Um, I put them on the teams not only as contributors but as uh, a check and balance against the deliverables of you know what is being developed, code reviewers, uh, you know the technical experts to give you the real skinny to look at the quality of the code, the stability of the code, uh, whether or not the code. Of course, we have automated tools to help. But the code is compliant with our policies and standards and coding standards uh, and so on. Do we get the appropriate level of unit test a company? Because we're really big into the automated develop automated test as well. So we have a configuration management environment that allows us to do one button deploys to the cloud, including one button deploys with automated tests. So the product gets built, put on a brand new virtual environment, configured uh, with a tool like Puppet, you know, dumped on there, and then automated scripts and tests run. And those scripts and tests, of course, produce a series of results. So we've also embraced that. That is part of DevOps, by the way, is sure. the ability to do that rapidly without human intervention. But it's really a check and balance. And I've noticed that, you know, in the old days when a developer would come to one of my staff who didn't know how to write, read or write Java, and they'd make a delivery, of course, the conversation went like this. The federal employee would ask, hey, contractor, buddy, how are you doing? He's like, oh, great. Well, you're delivering me a product today. Yep, here it is. Well, is it good? Oh, of course it is. Is it bug free? Oh, of course. No bugs. Never. Never bugs. Okay, and when we, we would install it, and of course, it'd run in production, it'd fail. And uh, then you get to pay the contractor again to fix it. <laughs> it's kind of like a Dilbert cartoon. Um, by placing a federal government employee with the right skill set right there up front, you're able to do that evaluation to know what level of quality you're getting. Combined with agile development, uh, you know, where you're producing a product every two to three weeks, uh, that's very powerful because now you're, you're guaranteeing the level of quality that you're going to get when you actually produce the product and put it in production. And that's a big deal. I wasn't able to properly find a way to incentivize the contractors appropriately to do that same level of due diligence. If you have another method, let me know. I'll sure, sure. Michael, Michael, what's going on here? I mean, are we talking to a startup CIO? We've heard cloud computing, DevOps, agile development, employee training, speed, quality. Or are we talking to a large-scale federal CIO? I, I mean, you, you, it's I, I don't know, Michael, what's going on? It is, <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty extraordinary to hear about this when you talk about having the best infrastructure that uh, that money can buy, when you talk about DevOps, Agile, when you talk about your attitude towards contracting, it really is like you're running a, a much smaller organization. So is the fact that you are funded by your users as opposed to uh, fr from federal budget, does that play a role in this or what's going on, John? Oh, I, I definitely think it does. Mm -hmm. um, the public, the Patents Public Advisory Committee and the Trademark Public Advisory Committee, um, I, let's see, there's it, the number of people varies and not all of them show up all the time, but there's about 10 or so people plus uh, some Fed, you know, some full-time USPTO members that have been appointed by the Secretary of Commerce on those two separate committees. We meet at least quarterly and they review everything. They have full insight and full access as an employee would to everything that we do. We also meet um, bi-monthly on the telephone to give them briefings. So they represent our constituency who pay fees. And um, I can tell you that uh, the lawyers that make up these groups and, and the users that make up the groups want quality. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, the amount of money, I mean, they're like, yeah, we give you more money if we could get more. 
right, more, better, faster, uh, and they do invest. Now, I'm not saying we as a federal agency don't. We also ride the tide of the economics of the uh, country. Of course, we already we also drive the economics of a significant portion of the country through innovation. But uh, there is um, some give and take there. But you talk about oversight. Uh, you know, I have those two, and of course, I have all the other pl plethora of other government agencies that love to check in on us now and again. But that level of oversight by people that are actually making the investment, that are that are like, you've got to generate us a result uh, now, right? Whereas typical federal government, you know, oversight is like, okay, well, we'll check with you in a year. Have a nice day. These folks are like, okay, what did you do for me yesterday? And can we drive more, faster, better, harder? Show me what you've done. You know, it can't be vaporware. We want to see it. We want to touch it. Sure. We want to feel it. And we want to hear from our constituents. And, and part of that, those two teams sits the unions, the three unions that we have here at the USPTO of users. So, the, uh, so they hear right from their own team members on PPAC and TPAC how the users think that we are doing. Uh, so it, it's impossible to hide anything. I mean, sure. everything is very widely in the open, and uh, it's it's the that's really come a long way, particularly when you know we just launched the patents end to end project. Uh, it had been attempted uh, three or four other times in the history of the agency and failed. Mm. Uh, this is the first time it succeeded. Uh, we launched it. We've trained about four thousand people. Congrats. Uh, oh, thank you. And uh, the users love it. In fact, they're telling us what they want added to it more than they're complaining about any particular bug, though there are bugs. There are always bugs. No one's ever going to say there's not. But um, we're rapidly fixing those, and we're listening to our customers, and that user-centered design interaction is just building. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing the same thing with Trademarks Next Gen, the end of the year, uh, towards the end of the year, as well as the fee processing for the external groups. And next year, we've got even more to give to the public. So, so, so yeah. this entire idea of connecting what IT spends with outcomes that are meaningful to users, as opposed to just process milestones. Well, we've done this test, we've done that test. Uh, it's such a strange, strange idea for a lot of IT. It doesn't. Well, really, it's doesn't, not that strange. Kind of hard to uh, hard hard to grasp that one. Well, so you know, we had two weeks ago. We had Mark Schwartz, who's the CIO of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, and he talked about oversight. And he said that the job of oversight committees is to remove obstacles. You know, rather than you know, be an impediment to innovation and efficiency. It sounds like in your world, oversight doesn't slow down innovation and efficiency. In fact, it encourages, as Michael said, outcomes tied to tech investments. Well, it. I can't say that it can't be used to slow things down. Sure. Okay. Um, I remember when we first started off patents end to end. There was a brief point in time where we had more people investigating patents end-to-end -end as a project than I had had people working on the project. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying that it can't go too far. Anything can go too far. Sure. But I think that when you have the right level of oversight, particularly by the, the people that are paying the fees to, you know, to, to provide, you know, um, the feedback, they are a little more careful on watching and, and learning and listening and producing results on a, a tighter ongoing basis. I mean, this isn't a once a year review and they walk away. This is a continuous conversation every couple of months and then a get together at least every quarter. And then a yearly report. I forgot the yearly report that goes to Congress as well as to the, the president. Uh, where they talk about the successes, failures, and the things that they have recommended that we change. And I think that they each treat it like it's money coming out of their own pocket because, and largely, they represent companies and, and themselves who do have money coming out of their pocket to fund the agency. 
So um, that level of oversight can be very constructive. I'm not going to say that all oversight is that constructive, but at least in this case, I, I do think it is. Makes sense. Digital, let's talk about digital government because you're right in the thick of it. So uh, to begin, when we, when we talk about digital government, and you can even bring in uh, open data if, if that interests you, but when we talk about digital government, what exactly do we mean? Well, I think the term digital government is used to describe a lot. <laughs> um, and I think if you'd ask five or six people that question, depending on where they're from, you'd get probably uh, seven or eight answers. But um, let's, let's go with the basics. For, for us, it's about fully embracing the electronic world, right? We would like all processing of patents and trademarks to happen electronically. Uh, I certainly would like to get rid of you know, legacy stuff like fax machines and snail mail, but that would never happen. But uh, it's about fully embracing that, but also fully embracing it from the beginning of the process to the end. So that doesn't just mean electronic intake, but it means electronic processing, electronic publishing, electronic disposition, uh, and then electronic posting of the patents and trademarks to the public in a way that they can consume them. Uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. And that's actually a lot more complicated in detail than you might think. So we have a lot of great intake systems today for both patents and trademarks, which we're going to revamp uh, to make even better and friendlier. But we sometimes in the middle, people still rely on faxes and, and paper trails, and um, they don't rely on email correspondence or as much video chat, though we offer those things. They don't... As, use them as much. Uh, we have to break down those barriers and make them more accessible. You know, that's that's very sure. important to us. But we've had recent uh, changes over the last few years. For example, we've had uh, the e-publishing of trademark um, trademarks, which uh, the EEOG, which is a, a product which is brand, brand new over the last two years. We used to publish every, I think it was every Tuesday, two big multi-hundred page volumes through the government printing office of new trademarks or updates to trademarks and it was a, a, a huge deal. Now you can go on to our site, uh, log in with your iPad or you know your tablet or your computer and while you're on the train or the subway you can log in and you can exam you can look at the mm -hmm. this week's publications or all the publications back for the last couple of years um, search them, correlate them, tag the ones you want to investigate or talk to, even click and send us, you know, mm. hey, this looks like mine. I mm. like the fact that someone is doing this. Um, and we've made all of that easy and acceptable, accessible. So that's one part of the digital government. The other part is mostly about data. You know, people talk about big data but making all of the data available not only in bulk but uh, through a series of APIs and then built upon those APIs a series of systems uh, which allow users to interact with them no matter what device they're using or operating mm -hmm. system through the web. And that is something that we've done a little bit on over the years. All of the data here at the USPTO is public. Uh, we ho were hosting it ourselves. We were using um, Several other companies, first Google and then Reed Technology to host it for us. Uh, we're hosting it ourselves this year, and then we have plans over the next few years to produce a series of REST-based APIs to allow access into that data that's now hosted in the Amazon and Google Federal Clouds, and uh, then building some user interfaces on that, for example, for public uh, patent search. Sure. Um, to allow people to look at all of the patents and all of the repositories that we have here from all of from our country but also our partner countries which is and a big John, and, and John why is this why is this so hard why is this so difficult to do give us some insight for people who are outside the government and who simply say this is not a big deal you know I want to simply go to the website and who don't have an understanding of what's actually involved so why is this so difficult well, as far as the USPTO goes, particularly for patents, uh, the examination system that I inherited when I got here was built for about 
2,500 examiners, and we have nearly 8,000. And the public-facing environment uh, that allows us to allows a, a user to query uh, patents data called public pair or private pair. Uh, if you wanted to just look at your private submissions post pre-publication, uh, we're tied to the examination system. So every person in public that logged in to look at something took up the same resources out of the same system that an examiner would. So it doesn't take a huge amount of time to realize that an examination system built for 2,000 people plus the public soon when we've hired, oh, well, 8,000 since it was originally launched to now uh, doesn't handle the load of people going to it well, particularly if a couple of data miners were to go after it, <laughs> which is why we had to uh, put in CAPTCHA for the public. Um, so one of the reasons it was so difficult is everything was intertwined. You know, the, the systems were still built based on the old automated information system with a ton of single points of failure. Um, that, you know, the pair system resides on, uh, you know, one or two computers that are not redundant. They just handle separate parts and a fixed data store, and that was it. That's all I had. So I've had to keep that all up and available and operating and try to scale it as best I could, both by stabilizing its software as well as buying legacy hardware to shore up some of those platforms that quite honestly had been produced in years. Um, at the same time, rewrite it, right? Because, <laughs> you know... Uh, not on that system, but on some trademark systems, just as an example, you know how expensive it is trying to find COBOL and AGOL programmers, and then the EMT staff, you have to keep on staff to resuscitate them, because let's face it, if you lose one, you're not going to find another. And, uh, well, that was supposed to be funny. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, we, uh, <laughs> well, we, have, we yeah. have a question from... Uh, from Twitter. Val and I are pretty dry. Well, I'm going to actually, I'm going to take that back. Val is pretty dry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know. I know. He and I were going to have words after, uh, yeah. <laughs> after this, uh, after this show. But we have a question from Twitter uh, from Ryan Fay, who asks, he wants to know what safeguards uh, the patent office, patent and trademark office, uh, plans to use to keep all of this data secure without limiting accessibility? That's a good question. So we are, we do keep the uh, data of record here and when we publish it out to the cloud we publish it one way. Hmm. So the APIs we have will push it to the cloud. We use the cloud like a giant cache, think of it like that. We also have a backup to alternate sites and we employ the the best and the brightest of the federal government security uh, and we meet the standards as um, well published through security audits and so on and so forth. Wow. Uh, but the first thing is, is the only people that can really change it is those in-house. And we have several layers of security to make sure that you don't have access to it unless you're here and you have the role of being able to change it. So even when uh, someone comes into the USPTO and says, we'd like to change the assignment of a patent, a patent was sold from one company to the other, they actually have to go through an electronic process which involves someone verifying it and making the change uh, today as a safeguard. There's no one wants to wake up one day and have all the patents owned by Bill, right? I mean, that's just not a good idea. Um, so that's the first safeguard, uh, the first series of safeguards. But you have to counter that with the fact that uh, except for a very small number of patents that are security related that are kept as paper and managed and reviewed by uh, the military examiners. These are things that we wouldn't want to publish. Hmm. Um, everything in the patents world, uh, unless it's in that group or a small group that's held because of court order, they're all published after 18 months and every trademark is published the second you hit the enter button on submittal. So the bulk of our information is public, so the focus that I really have is protect the stuff pre-publication for patents, yep. uh, the stuff that's secured gets turned into paper and handled through 
our military connections, and the the rest uh, is open to the world. And all I have to do is to make sure that no one has the ability to go in and change it. And so that's a much less complicated model than sure. some folks have to sure. to do. John, you said you work with the best technology. Does that mean you work with startups as well? Um, sometimes. You know, uh, we have worked with some some uh, smaller companies. I won't call them quite startups, but um, smaller companies. I, I know on some of the contracts that I've had, there were small companies at the start and large companies by the time we were done with them. Sure. Um, we also sometimes do, uh, of course, we do RFIs and RFPs sure. for technologies. Uh, there's been a long-standing need to find a technology that can look at pictures and identify things and that technology is coming along and so we've certainly done that investigation for a number of years and called up people, asked them to come out and demo their wares and talk to us about their technologies and what they do. Sure. So, um, you know, we though we are exempt from some parts of the FAR, we do have to follow others. So there are importances to getting procurement involved early and f dotting the I's or crossing the T's because, you know, I don't look good in orange. And <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, we're, we're almost out of time. So, so finish us out with some advice from your perspective on how IT leaders, either in the government or outside the government, can remain relevant in this digital age? What are the keys to a CIO and IT remaining relevant? Um, keep producing. Um, if it doesn't work, change what you're doing, try again. If you fail again, that's fine. Just keep trying, Just but you gotta produce. You gotta be in tune with the customer. You gotta be in tune with the business. You have to produce a a product in a quality in a timely manner that they that the customer wants. Embrace ideas that you're not familiar with. User-centered design, agile development, DevOps. Look to produce a quality product. You know, EVM, which the government regularly uses, is a very poor indicator, in my opinion, of of quality because it doesn't account for quality. Um, and you can be on budget and release a product and still produce something that no one wants to use, and that's a serious problem. Um, I think we have a lot in the federal government to learn from industry, and it pains me greatly to know that the federal government spends that $80 billion a year, and we're not the leaders in IT. We should be generating these ideas. We spend more money, unless you're Google, uh, than almost everyone else combined. And if you think about it, uh, that's a lot of practice. Uh, and we should pr be producing a heck of a series of good products and services um, for the people of the United States and, and in, in my case, the world. Um, but we're not going to get there if we continue to do things the old way. And in, in my opinion, uh, one of the greatest things that happened since I've been here was... Uh, Formal federal CIO Vivek Kundra allowed us to use Agile, and uh, that shook things up. And we need more of that. We need more people saying we can try things and work with the stuff that the you know the industry does, and um, if it works, continue to refine it and use it and adapt it to the federal government. But it's all about producing that quality product in a timely manner and listening to your customers and producing something that they want to use. And uh, if you want to remain relevant, keep up your technical skills and produce. And that's the best way I knew to be relevant in private industry, and it's the best way I know to be relevant here. Okay, great lessons on relevance. Well, Vala, I'm afraid, sadly, it's that time. That was a very fast 45 minutes, John. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the first DevOps conference in the Washington, D.C. area. and. Thank you so much for taking time during the conference to be with us on CXO Talk. You were fantastic. Well, thank you both. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right, we you all have, have a good day. We have been talking with John Owens, who is the CIO of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, on episode number 115 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Kriegsman, and I wish my co-host Vala Afshar a, a what? A great weekend.
<laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Everybody, come back next time. One last thing, subscribe to our newsletter. It's great. You'll never miss a show. Subscribe now. Thanks, everybody. And John Owens, thank you so much. Bye-bye.